And now I'm very pleased to introduce you to my friend, Dan Hesse. Thank you, Jim. Um, I, I really appreciate the kind introduction. Can you all hear me okay? Is technology working? Good, okay. Um, well, by the way, uh, Jim's dad was one of my heroes. He was a mentor and a, and a wonderful friend, and, uh, and, and I miss him, and I know you do too, Jim. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm three time zones away, um, but I know Fort Myers well. I know the Naples area in particular uh, well because we would go there with the boys on spring break year in and year out. And one of the big reasons was spring baseball in Fort Myers. We would go to the Twins games and the Red Sox games. And my boys even got to uh, be bat boy for the Red Sox um, at, uh, at JetBlue, which was uh, you know some of my favorite pictures, which uh, um, has me start with a Red Sox story. So um, Patty O'Hara, he's in Boston. Uh, he's, uh, he's driving around Fenway Park to see the Red Sox take on the hated Yankees. And he's driving and driving and he cannot find a parking space at all. And he's getting really anxious because he can hear the crowd noise inside. The first pitch has already been thrown. The first inning has started. His buddies are in, the, you know, are, are in, are in their seats. So he looks up uh, skyward and he says, uh, Jesus, I know I haven't been the very best Catholic. I only go to, to mass on Easter. I promise you, if you find me a parking spot, I'll go to mass every Sunday. Right that instant, right in front of Fenway Park, this car pulls out and Patty sees an open spot and he looks up and he goes, Jesus, never mind, I found one. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, we can, you know, we can, you know, we can laugh about, uh, you know, about Catholics because, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about culture and Catholicism really is, it's a religion, it's more than a culture, but it is a culture. And I really believe that um, the values that the, that the Catholic faith represents all, also are aligned with the cultures of companies that have been proven to be successful um, over time. So, um, uh, you know, I think our shared Catholic culture can play an important role uh, in capitalism going forward. And I'm gonna use my own experience at Sprint in particular as, as an example. So in terms of my uh, kind of my upbringing, I was, uh, I was raised by two very Catholic parents. My mom's side of the family, very Irish. My dad's side of the family, very German. And to kind of give you a, a feel for the differences in culture, it could perhaps be described by, you know, the two shortest books ever written, one being the Irish cookbook and the other, the last five centuries of German humor. Um, just, you know, it kind of um, you know, gives you a feel for the differences they came from. But the thing about uh, the Catholic faith, they both shared that and it kind of trumped either of those, um, those other experiences, but although we, we, we saw it when we would visit the relatives. So I grew up as a military brat. My dad was in the army um, and uh, I went to high school. I was graduating from high school in Germany and it led me to my first important kind of choice uh, in life, which is where I'm gonna to go to college. I moved around a lot, um, again, uh, 10 schools in grades one through 12, but this time it was gonna be my choice. And it reminds me of the, the story of, you know, a Jesuit, a Dominican and a Franciscan, they were walking down um, a road together, you know, talking about the greatness of their orders. And suddenly right in front of them, this apparition appears and it's Jesus in a manger with Mary and Joseph standing over um, the baby Jesus. The Franciscan, he falls to his knees in awe of God being born in such poverty. The Dominican falls to his knees just in awe of the glory of the apparition and the story of the Trinity. The Jesuit walks up, puts his arm around Joseph and says, hey, have you thought of where you're gonna send the kid to school? Um, so, uh, you know, that, um, that was a big decision for me. And I, so I decided to go to a Catholic university and I'm, I, I know there's a lot of domers in the crowd and actually Notre Dame is not Jesuit. It's the, it's the Holy, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the Holy Cross Fathers. 
but it was a it was a fabulous education and i had a liberal education i, I majored in liberal arts and uh, as an undergraduate really the first great book i read on leadership was plato's republic and it was about socrates talking to plato and other students uh, of socrates and it was written 400 years before you know before jesus um, and what i learned from this book, and it was really about political leadership, and it was about democracy. That was kind of the background. But first, that leadership is a privilege. Second, that great leaders are unifiers. And the example that you know Socrates used was a great leader could bring together the craftsmen, who were the workers, the aristocracy, and the military, where one plus one plus one is equal to far more than three. The great leaders are always learning and seeking the truth, and that it was very important on everyone to make sure that the best person, and that is defined as the most just person, is chosen as the leader, with justice being the first of the four virtues, those four virtues being justice, temperance, courage, and intelligence. So after graduation, you know, I kind of th had to think about what I was going to go do. And you see the ads on TV. Um, you know, what are you willing to fight for? The, ND, the Notre Dame ads. And there was this element of going to school there where there was this question, what were you going to do with this, you know, great education that you are lucky enough to have been given? Uh, and, uh, and you think about vocation. And I always really thought about business, especially a large business, as being a vocation akin to the clergy, parenting, um, civic leadership, because businesses affect the lives and livelihoods of so many people. Large companies, and I use AT&T and Sprint as example, you know, tens of thousands, if not millions of, of, uh, of employees, uh, millions of customers, shareholders, suppliers, people that live in the communities. And if you just think about overall impact, you just take a look at the US economy, the private sector is more than three times the size of the public sector, roughly 15, you know, over 15 trillion versus about uh, 5 trillion for the, for the public sector. So there's, there's a potential to, you know, if you think about it as a vocation to really have an impact. So I decided to, and when I got out of business school, um, the hot thing to do what most of my buds were doing were they were going into either consulting or investment banking. That's where the jobs were. And quite frankly, that's where the money was. Um, but I wanted to go work for a big company and I chose AT&T, which back in those days, it was the Bell system. It was by far the largest company on earth. We had, you know, well over a million employees. Um, and uh, it was just an enormous outfit. But what AT&T had that I learned from is it had a really strong culture based upon three fundamental elements. And these elements, you'll hear me talk about them more. I think as we, and I actually know this from, from, from studying it, uh, this, the most successful business cultures uh, and the most successful companies have strong cultures and the cultures that are the most successful tend to have as its pillars have people, customers and some kind of purpose. So in the case of AT&T, there was this focus on people. I remember, uh, you know, there was this saying, no, no job is so urgent that it can't be done safely. And we'd have all these safety meetings and, and what have you, that was important. Customers were extremely important. There were these pictures of, and you can Google them if you don't know who he is, Angus McDonald. And Angus was this guy in snowshoes going through this storm and you could see was going to fix this, you know, this telephone pole with a line that was hanging down to restore service someplace. And when you get into purpose, that was actually one of the purposes that you had in working for AT&T was this notion of universal service. Back in those days, there really wasn't competition. You know, at AT&T, it was like providing air or water. We provide we provided service and we prided ourselves in providing great service. But Bell Labs was a natural resource. It was a national resource. I mean, the, the, um, the scientists at Bell Labs, I mean, not only do they invent the, the transistor, which was widely used 
uh, but they, you know, during World War II helped, um, helped the military develop radar, which helped us win the war, uh, discovered like the black hole, which, which helped us in space. And actually to learn the purpose of what we did from monetary perspective in terms of our shareholders as a young employee for the first two years, you had to go visit five shareholders. Uh, you got a card, you had to go visit five owners of AT&T stock because it was a widows and orphan stock to go tell them about the company. It was called, it was shareholder relations in those days, but it gave you an appreciation of how important our financial performance was because we paid a dividend and you began to realize how many people depended upon that AT&T dividend for their livelihood. So there was this big notion of, uh, of purpose and meaning. And actually, I, I've, um, I really notice it now. You're reading about the great resignation, all these people not coming back to work. And they're not coming back to work because work is a paycheck. And they just do the math and say, you know, I've got enough in terms of government checks or enough saved or what have you. I don't have to come back to work. There's not a real meaning that work had for me. There weren't people that I'm dying to see again. And I think those companies that have not developed those strong cultures are going to have an increasingly difficult time when remote work um, or even, uh, you know, when, when workers don't really have to work become more of an issue. So culture um, uh, is, uh, is, is extremely important. And, um, and again, when I talk about, uh, you know, the, the vocational aspect of, uh, of what you do, um, you know, as CEO, the lives, the millions of lives and livelihoods that you impact, you know, all the, the folks I've talked about, you know, employees, customers, shareholders, suppliers, um, it's, uh, it's what you do. That is, you have to be successful. You know, if the company goes, goes bankrupt or belly up, uh, you've affected a lot of lives negatively. So the company has to be successful, but it's also how you do it. Jim mentioned um, earlier in his introductory, introductory rem remarks. And I'm gonna use Sprint as, as kind of my example in the turnaround at Sprint, where if you take a look at kind of everything we did, I would say culture was really the MVP um, of the turnaround. So going back to 2007, you in my bio, uh, Jim mentioned I was the CEO of Embark. Embark at the time was the fourth largest landline phone company um, in the, you know, in the U.S. I was in Kansas City, where Sprint was also headquartered, and they'd come after me a few times because they were beginning to have some performance problems to be CEO, and I wasn't interested. Embark was a great company. I was having a great time. I had a great leadership team, a great board. The stock was doing well. Uh, there was no reason to leave. Um, but I had this conversation with my wife one evening and she said, you know, can't, you know, Sprint, we, we were in Kansas City and Sprint was headquartered there. Um, if Sprint you know, runs into trouble, it's not going to be good for Kansas City. And you love, you know, Dan, you love our hometown. Uh, you know, if, if you want to, you have my blessing to, uh, to take a look at, uh, at, at running Sprint, because if anybody can fix Sprint, you know, of course, it's my wife, but you would expect her to say, she said, you know, I think you can. And of course, I had experience in, in wireless because, as Jim mentioned earlier, I had been the CEO at, uh, at AT&T Wireless. So to make a, you know, um, long story short, I, uh, well, I guess it won't be that short because I'm going to tell you a little bit more. But uh, I took the Sprint job and um, I was at the Sprint hangar and Sprint had, because it had, the reason it was in the trouble it was in, about two and a half years before that, it had merged with Nextel. And so the Sprint Nextel merger just wasn't really going all that well. So the Sprint had, had been headquartered in Kansas City, but actually the corporate headquarters had moved to Reston, Virginia at that time, which is where Nextel had been headquartered. So I was at the Sprint hangar. They still had a, a, an airplane hangar in, in Kansas City. And I was getting ready to fly to Reston because Reston being corporate headquarters um, to meet the next day because I just signed the, I was actually on the fax machine. Remember those things? I was signing my, my employment agreement at the at the Sprint hangar. As soon as that was done, I got on the got got on the airplane to fly to Reston because the next morning I was meeting with the press, with our employees, and with our key investors or, or, or shareholders as the, as the new CEO of the company. I get on the plane, 
And the head of PR at Sprint loves to tell the story because it was just me and him on the corporate jet because he's going to be with me and he's explaining what is going to happen to me tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. And he gives me this binder and it's got the press release and all this stuff. And I get to like tab four, I think it was, and it had the business plan. And I look at it and he's looking at me closely and I just started yelling expletives at him. And I said, this business plan, this, um, this has the company filing for bankruptcy in six months. This can't be true. And he goes, oh, yes, it is. Of course, I had never been told anything like this. And of course, the street didn't know. Nobody knew that things were quite that dire. So, uh, so needless, needless to say, there was a sense of urgency. And when I got in front of the employees, the employees had always been told everything was going fine. You know, things, you know, we just have a few bumps in the road. We'll get, you know, we'll get the, the, the ship righted. But they knew in their hearts that something was much more broken. They knew things were, things were bad. So I think very important uh, for any leader in a crisis, and you never want to waste a good crisis, is to be very forthright and honest with your people. But I waited a day or two because what you don't want to do is that you're in there that you've just learned yourself hours before you're about to file for bankruptcy. You don't tell them that. It's you, you tell them things are bad, but you also have a plan. So you don't, you know, it's not like, you know, I don't walk into a theater and just yell fire. That's not the right answer. You walk into a theater and you point to the exits and you say, these rows go to this exit, this row go to these exits. You have to have a plan. So at Sprint, um, I developed kind of the plan of the playbook. And the key, I think, in terms of a turnaround is you, if you, you have to figure out, number one, what you're going to do. That's your strategy. Number two, who's going to do it, you know, kind of who's going to be on the team. And number three, how. And that's the culture. So at Sprint, number one, what we were going to do. We had to fix the customer experience, the brand, and we had to do something about cash. The customer experience, the reason Sprint was in the trouble it was in, is customers were leaving like crazy. And the reason they were leaving like crazy is the company had cut customer service, customer care expenses. And the reason was, is because this, the merger of Sprint and Nextel was predicated on bringing these two wireless companies together. And there were going to be all these savings by going from two separate networks to one network, putting all the customers on one network. That looked great on a PowerPoint or a view graph, but they use different, different technology standards, different frequencies. Jim will know this. Think you couldn't put the networks together. So since there were no savings there, the leadership team was all incentivized and paid on hitting those synergy targets. They started cutting expenses everywhere else. So the customer experience went to hell. Number two on the brand, you have to be very clear in terms of what you stand for to customers. If you looked at our competitors at the time, Verizon, very clear. Can you hear me now? It was all about the quality of the network. AT&T, the iPhone, we're the only one with it. You want the iPhone, you have to come to AT&T. T-Mobile, low price. Very clear brand messages. We really didn't have one. We came up with simplicity because smartphones were new at the time. Rate plans were really complicated. So you had, you know, different charges for data, different charges for text, different charges for voice, really complicated. We were the first to come in with all you can eat unlimited plans, made things very simple. The third element was cash. And I took the folks through this. They called me Professor Dan, but people needed to understand that um, we were going to need some layoffs. There was just no other way. We didn't have the money to pay the bills. And we had to cut our operating expenses by one third and our capital spending by two thirds. But I took them through the math, kind of like a checkbook. This is all we have. And if we don't take this, these expenses out, we're not gonna be here, if you will, for the, for the, for the, for the rest of the, uh, you know, for perpetuity and, and for those that, uh, that, that are still here. And they, they appreciated that kind of candor. On the who side, it was related to, you know, to, to layoffs, but, it was really having the right team. And we changed half the board and half the senior leadership team. But part of it was, and you, you do it the right way. I sat down with, I'm still friends and talk with a number of the people that I quite frankly laid off um, at, you know, you know, at the beginning there, because we just had to. 
And I asked, you know, each person on the leadership team, and lots of them just didn't want to. I said, are you willing to work 24 seven? Because we're in, you know, we're in, in deep trouble, and it's going to be probably for a couple of years. And a lot of people just didn't want to sign up for it. And so the best thing to do is to give them a package and let them leave because it was going to be very, very hard work. And third was, was how, which is the culture. And, you know, company culture is really important. And worse than not having a culture was having two uh, and having two at odds cultures. And that's what I walked into. So in the first two or three sentences that I heard from anybody when they introduced themselves to me was whether they were legacy sprint or legacy Nextel. That to them defined who they were. So I go, oh my gosh, you know, th that's part of the problem. There's not one team. There's still two teams. Um, and actually the way, you know, I, I highly recommend against a merger of equals because what happened in this merger of equals, you know, Sprint had 50.1%, Nextel 49.9 financially, but they, you know, they took half the senior leadership team was from Sprint you know, half from Nextel, half the board from Sprint, half from Nextel. The, instead of picking the headquarters, they had the operating headquarters in Kansas City, Sprint's old headquarters, the, um, uh, the corporate headquarters in, in Reston, the Sprint name, the Nextel colors, all those kinds of things. Um, that was a problem. So I got up in front of the, the, the team and said, I never want anybody ever to tell me whether you were legacy sprint and legacy next hill. And I would tell people the story of how that's a problem. And you could hear this snickering and laughing because everybody knew it was true. And so it was easier for me coming in as an outsider. Neither one saw me from the other side. I said, look, we're going to have one culture. There are fantastic elements of the sprint culture. And I ticked off a few. There are fantastic elements of the next hill culture. I ticked off a few elements of that. There are fantastic things about other cultures of companies that have been extremely successful. I ticked off a few of those. I said, what we're gonna do, because I knew I wanted to engage them. I this was a great opportunity to create a culture from whole cloth. I asked the whole team, I said, I'm gonna send out a questionnaire. I'm gonna put these 25 attributes that I think make up the best that a company culture, that a company can be. And we're gonna pick 10. I can tell you though, we're actually collectively only gonna pick nine because one of those things is something that's missing. I'm telling you, I'm picking now, and that's accountability. Accountability is gonna be on there because one of the problems that we face at Sprint, one of the reasons we're in the problems, having the problems we are, is no one in the company has a PL, profit and loss, under me. Everything kind of came up to me. Nobody else really had responsibility for the whole picture of whatever they were doing. So accountability is going to be it, and also, Culture is the CEO's job. The buck stops here. The culture is strong. It's the CEO's role to make it that way. If it's weak, it's the CEO's fault. So I'm accountable for culture. So I'm going to be the one who chooses it. But I want your input. I don't want to make it in a vacuum. This is where, the way a lot of things are going to be done. Um, I'm going to make the call, but I need you to tell me what you want. So everybody participated in that. We picked kind of those tell 10 elements that made up what we call the sprint imperatives, which were our culture. And then we would, you know, the important things once you pick it is then you start to embody and live and let them visualize what the culture kind of really, really means. Like we'd have thank you Thursdays where we'd all get um, in the cafeteria and write thank you notes to customers to show the customers and the customer experience was number one, is important, and what have you. But the CEO then has three really big levers they can pull. Is once you've decided, if you will, the what, the how, uh, and the who, then the three levers one has to pull is compensation. You put in the compensation plan, people do it. People do what they're paid to do. Um, and so I use the compensation plan, and I talk to the board, completely scrapping it, and having everybody's compensation be based upon these key customer metrics, the number of calls to care, fewer being better, the number of customers that were leaving us and what have you, and also to bind the culture together to have every employee in the company on exactly the same pay plan and measurement. So the amount of at risk, so that was kind of the bonus, was different depending upon your level and what have you and what percentage was at risk. 
but you're ask everybody's at risk pay was all either at 110% or at 75% based upon how we were doing on those metrics. So number one, things moved quickly because we put these customer service metrics in compensation. Number two, agenda. People do what's, you know, what you spend time on. I remember, and I'll talk about AT&T, who I've already, already talked about it, but, you know, at AT&T, sometimes, you know, quality would be, you know, that, you know, would be the, the program of, of, of the year, but we wouldn't spend any time on it. Um, and if you don't spend time on it, you just don't make that kind of progress. So the customer experience, you know, became number one, the first item on every one of my ops team's agendas. Every Monday, I'd have a meeting with my operations team, the first thing on every agenda. And by the way, it was the first thing on every ops team agenda every week for all seven years I was there as CEO. What that does is it not only shows everybody it's important, but to get their boss ready for my meetings, my direct reports, the customer experience would be on that agenda because they wanted to be ready when they got to my meeting and then the people under them to get them ready for their boss's meeting. So it cascaded down. So if that was on my agenda, it was on every agenda. It was on the agenda of every meeting in the entire company. And, uh, and number three, I'd say is measurement. Uh, lots of things, clearly financial metrics, some of these other customer metrics you measure, but you have to measure it to make progress. And culture is one of those things that a lot of companies don't measure. You can measure culture. You need to articulate your culture, which is what we did. And I'll get to that in just a second in terms of how we articulated it. But every quarter I'd send out a survey. So they voted on what the culture is. How are we doing on each of those 10 things? And put it up there in red, yellow, green on whether it was moving up or moving down. So it was just as important. They knew culture was just as important as every other financial metric, earnings per share, you know, customer, you know, new subscribers or what have you. And as a result, culture became even more ingrained and we worked on those things to make our culture stronger. So I know you can't see this, but what this is, is a picture of a wallet card I gave to everybody. And basically it's the size of a, a business card. Everybody had it in their wallet. And on one side, it was our strategy. Um, you know, improve the customer experience, build the brand, generate cash. Then, so that's the what. The who, of course, if you had a card, you were a who. If you didn't have a, you know, if you didn't have a card, you weren't one of the who. You were already one of the who. And the third item was the culture. So we delineated the 10 items that made up our culture, what we call the sprint imperatives. Um, and those were, just quickly, number one was do it now, which is just a sense of urgency. You know, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Just do it. Just do it, do it, do it. Because again, at the beginning, especially, we only had months to live. Um, number two and three, number two, delegate and empower. And number three was accountability because they kind of go together. You delegate responsibility for decision-making to people uh, and you empower them, uh, but you also hold them accountable, but they appreciate this. And when I think of Catholic values of everything on here, this may be perhaps even the most important because it shows people you value them, you trust them, you believe in them, you have confidence in them if you delegate and let them make decisions. The other key though, in terms of doing it now and why it's right after that, a big ship, like a big company, it moves as fast as the number of decisions that are made every day, which is directly proportional to the number of decision makers that you have. If you have a thousand decision makers, you're probably going to make a thousand times more decisions that day than if you only had one. So that was crucial to moving the ship forward. And if everybody knows the what, knows what the strategy is, it's very clear, you have confidence that everybody's rowing, if you will, in the same direction. And if you also share the same values or culture. Next are focusing on customers, obviously. Um, demonstrating teamwork and camaraderie, and I put, emphasize, put the emphasis on demonstrate. Demonstrate teamwork and camaraderie, and then competing like winners. And in terms of visualization, I'll just give you a story to, make, to show you how I got my, kind of my team around, you know, how to think about it. So it's not that many months, it's 2008. 
I'm in my office. It's the U.S. Golf Open at Torrey Pines. Uh, and there's a playoff. It's a Monday. We're in the office and there's a Monday playoff between Tiger Woods and Rocco Media, for those of you who may remember that. And, you know, I have a TV in the office and, and we're working like hell. But my, you know, the left of my eye was kept going up and it was a fantastic, it was just close as can be. And what you had is Rocco Media playing fantastic and just scrapping. And you had him going up against Tiger Woods and Tiger Woods could barely walk. It was like the Masters this year. If you remember, he had surgery right after that. You know, he winced on every shot, but he was, both these guys were competing like crazy. And I said, this is a great learning moment. I went to my secretary and I said, you call everyone in my direct report reports. I just want you to tell them, Dan is mad as hell and wants to see you in the office now. And so she called every one of them, just said, Dan's mad as hell and he wants you in the office right now. And these people kind of, all my direct reports came running up to my office really quickly. And I, and I put chairs all around the TV and I said, take a seat. And we sat and watched the back nine um, together. And it was just, it was really a terrific experience because we saw it kind of, you could visualize this competition that it was all about winning um, but we collectively were becoming, becoming kind of a team and sharing that experience, you know, together. So, you know, these kind of visualization opportunities, I think, are an important part of leadership. Develop. That's another part, you know, we talked about, um, you know, the, the leader always keeps seeking the truth. We learn, um, my parents kept telling me I could always do better, keep developing yourself, use all your God-given talents, innovate. A lot of our innovation, I'll talk about this very briefly, was around making the world a better, a better place. How are we going to create mobile products for people who um, are sight impaired or hard of hearing or artis autistic? Or how are we going to make driving safer, et cetera? So a lot of our innovation. And we got to the point where in my last couple of years at Sprint, we were being granted over two U.S. patents a day. So, um, you know, it, this focus on, on innovation um, uh, was a big part of who we were. Act with, you know, act with integrity. Obviously, that's kind of table stakes at the end of every meeting. Just a quick question. Are we doing the right thing? And last, have fun. You know, we as leaders, you know, when we think of, of you know, the fact that we're, you know, we're Catholics, uh, and we have these people working for us, they're either happy or unhappy at work based upon a lot of factors, but the environment that we create, the support of nature, the quality of the work, everything else uh, that we do has a lot to do with their happiness. And that's half their waking hours are at work. So having fun was, was important. And I think is consistent with our, with our Catholic values. The last thing from a leadership lesson perspective um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's interesting from a timing um, uh, point of view is that you may have um, read just a few weeks ago, they found the endurance, which was Sir Ernest Shackleton's ship. He had this expedition down to the South Pole. He never made it to the South Pole. But of all the examples of leadership that I've ever read uh, or witnessed uh, or seen, I think it's the greatest example of leadership ever in my view, and I use it as an example. So my very first week on the job as the CEO of Sprint, I ordered 100 DVDs of a PBS documentary called The Endurance. And if any of you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you get it. It's 90 minutes. Um, it's narrated by Liam Neeson, who like Shackleton is also Irish. Um, and it is a fantastic documentary. There's other stories of, of Shackleton. But what it, it shows is this innovative, caring person. Everybody should have died. And all 26 of the men got back alive. And Shackleton, the way he cared about each individual, um, and even, even the way they led, um, the, you know, for example, the sleeping bags, the feather bags were a lot warmer than the wool bags. But the leadership, they, they slept in the wool bags and the warmer feather bags were given to the men. So there were lots and lots of examples, but um, 
you know, when the story came out a few weeks ago, I got hundreds of calls, emails, LinkedIn messages. Hey, you see, they found the endurance because it was such a part of our culture. Uh, and some people have, you know, talked about Shackleton as kind of a, a Christ figure in, in some regards. So successful cultures, again, are focused on people, customers, and purpose. And at, at Sprint, kind of our purpose, we had the four Ps. I'm dating myself, but the marketing textbooks, the Phil Cotlery also had the four Ps, I think product, price, promotion, place. Our four Ps were the planet. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember reading early on that you could take just e-waste alone. You could line dump trucks, bumper to bumper from Washington DC to Orlando, Florida, and completely fill them with e-waste. Most of it being cell phones being thrown out each year and just the, the amount of waste that um, our industry created. So we focused on phone recycling, cutting water use and what have you. So um, every year Newsweek would, rec would uh, recognize America's greenest companies. We'd be the only telecom company um, on the list. Products, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we figured out how to use text-to-speech and speech-to-text and other capabilities of our, of our mobile technology to improve our products for the hard of hearing and the sight impaired and the autistic. And um, texting and driving was a big issue. So um, Sprint Drive First was a product which we developed and gave out free where parents could just turn it on whenever they knew their child, their teenager was driving and it sensed when that phone was moving faster than 10 miles an hour, it turned the phone off. You know, it couldn't receive any text messages and couldn't send text messages except for mom and dad, you know, when that happened to kind of, uh, because texting and driving was a big issue. We were the first to really embrace pri uh, privacy, which was the third P um, where, you know, companies, and it cost us money, started using your personal data for your advertising because advertisers would pay more for targeted data if they know about you. But we said, you know, we think the data is the customers. And so rather than having you have to opt out not to use your personal data, we were the only wireless company that said, okay, we're not gonna give away your personal data unless you opt in. And then philanthropy in terms of our time was the fourth P. So, um, Kind of finally, in terms of our, our results, um, customer experience, uh, we went from last to first, whether it be JD Power. Uh, we, went, you know, we won 20 JD Power awards. We were dead last. We went to first. The American Customer Satisfaction Index, we went from last to first. As a matter of fact, the, the ACSI mentioned us as the most improved company in the United States in any industry, period, across all 43 industries that they study. Um, in terms of cash, uh, we actually spent $2 billion a year less on customer service because we eliminated the pain points when we were number one in JD Power than when we were last and it dropped to the bottom line. So in you know, kind of my last two years as CEO of the 500 companies that make up the S&P 500 index, Sprint's total shareholder return ranked number one of all of those 500 companies. In terms of people, our morale went from kind of bottom quartile to the top of the top. And we received all sorts of awards for you know, best places to work and diversity and inclusion, et cetera. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and finally, with respect to brand, and the reason I mentioned brand is culture really is that MVP. Your brand um, and culture are so aligned, if you will, that if you think almost as a Venn diagram, culture is kind of the, the human embodiment of your brand and your corporate reputation is also related to your brand. We saw the brand improve, probably the best measure is just how you increase in terms of the number of customers. But our corporate reputation was also related to that. And the Reputation Institute um, measures the overall corporate reputation of the 1,000 largest companies in the world. And it recognized Sprint for the most improved over, overall corporate reputation of any company um, in the world. So um, kind of the nice thing about it is, you know, now when you're retired, we'll call it the, the dividends of focusing on culture. Um, you know, just this week, actually, the, 
the wife of my former CFO at Sprint, you know, she was here for a couple of days with, with, with my wife. There's not a week that goes by that I don't talk to um, friends or, or, or people that I, that I worked with at Sprint or AT&T or, or, or prior companies. It's a, it's a bond that, um, that, that, that lasts and lasts. As a matter of fact, each year, um, I take over a Irish bar in Kansas City called the Dubliner, uh, and we have a sprint reunion of the kind of my top kind of 75 or so, and people come in, including the board of directors, come in from all over the country, and we get together um, once a year because we became so close. We created, you know, we, we were part of this, 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 this culture that, uh, that, that we really don't ever want to lose sight of. And, and the other thing I'll mention is, you know, when I retired, my retirement party, um, they had it in this, this big venue on the Sprint campus. Uh, and around it were banners, each one of those being 10 banners of the 10 elements of our culture, because that's when, when people thought of me, they thought of, you know, of, of the culture. And people have asked me, what's the most valuable, you know, thing you own, Dan? And I think it has, it's probably the, a book of letters that um, they, they put together and gave me as a, my going away present, which is a book of hundreds and hundreds of letters from employees of the company, most of which I may have met once or twice, maybe in the cafeteria while I was getting my lunch or, or maybe never even met, just saying how much they enjoyed working at Sprint during those years when I was there. You know, just how much, how proud they were of the company, um, how it fulfilled them, how enjoyable it was. And that, you know, that, that, that just means everything. So then I retired, which takes me to retirement. And, um, you know, I, in, in looking at business, you know, when you step away, um, you know, I noticed that, you know, capitalism, uh, was losing favor. And there were a number of surveys that I, that I read that the majority of Americans, especially those under 30, did not believe capitalism was the best economic system. Um, and I could kind of understand it because what they'd say is that capitalism only works for a few. It doesn't work well for everybody. And I'm a capitalist. Um, and I believe it can and it should. And capitalism to survive kind of needs to improve. And that's why I believe that we'll call it Catholic culture, which is aligned really with serving all stakeholders well, is the potential survival of capitalism. And capitalism is so important as an American because I see capitalism really as political freedom, which goes well with um, I'm sorry, is financial freedom, which goes with democracy, which is political freedom, and religious freedom. They're kind of a virtuous circle, if you will, those, you know, those, those three things. And socialism or even regulation, that's a penalty that capitalists pay for kind of abusing the freedom, you know, the, the, the unbridled freedom that our great open economic system allows us. We just need to look out for all stakeholders. So I joined the board of a, of a nonprofit that's really focused on this called Just Capital. And what Just Capital does, and what I like about Just Capital is, it doesn't, in terms of defining what just behavior is, it doesn't have a bunch of you know, smart guys like, like me or others who have been in business or pundits, it surveys the American people every year. So tens of thousands of surveys of the American people in terms of what kind of behavior they wanna see from the companies they buy products from, go to work for, or invest in. And, and um, go to the website, I highly recommend it if you wanna kind of see it because it ranks companies, um, based upon hard data of how they do in these areas. There's lots of specific questions. But in essence, what the American people want is, and they do believe in capitalism if they can serve all stakeholders. And what's really interesting 
especially in this divided political world we have, is how small of a difference there is in the answers between Republicans, Democrats, and independents. What they want to see companies do, number one, is treat its workers really well. That's number one. Number two, its communities. Number three, its customers. Number four, its shareholders. And number five, the environment. And so again, if you want to see which companies are doing well, you can see overall because really the, 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 the surveys put more weighting on some other areas. So heavy weighting on how a company treats its workers, for example, is the most important. You can see how companies are ranked um, overall and then by a particular area. If you're really interested in just workers or you're really interested in just the environment, you can go see that um, as well. But what I really like is what the, what the just capital rankings also prove is that the most just companies, those that serve all share stakeholders well, also do the best job of serving shareholders. That the most just companies, those that quite frankly pay their people the best, also have the best stock prices over the long term. And that's the air cover I was always looking for as a CEO. I remember getting grilled like in 2014 on CNBC, you know, and in Bloomberg, oh, you know, why are you focusing on all this, you know, on all this environmental stuff and phone recycling, you know, et cetera. What does that do for this quarter's profits? They're like missing the point because um, that was really important to our people, just like our culture was. It's what engaged them and why they, they work so hard and why they would, quite frankly, when I went to the Notre Dame campus, why the Notre Dame students would pick us over Apple or Google or Microsoft or other places they had to go because they do want purpose. By the way, on the subject of purpose, I don't know if any of you have watched the television show. It's on Apple TV called Severance because that's kind of the opposite of it. It's a great Orwellian, it's extremely well done. I highly recommend, season one just ended, but you know, you can, HBO Max, you can go watch all the, the past seasons, but it's kind of the opposite. It's these people who the company won't tell them what they're working on. And these people so much wanna work, wanna know what they're doing. And it doesn't want them to meet or get close to any of the people they work with. And, they, and the employees are dying to get to know one another and develop bonds and relationships with one another. It's a really great story and kind of um, the, the the opposite. The other thing, um, the other thing that the data shows is not only do the ju most just companies have the highest shareholder return, the most just companies have really strong cultures and cultures again that are focused on people, customers, and purpose. Um, the other thing we're seeing now is I serve as a director. I know a lot of you are probably very familiar with, with board governance. You're seeing a new term come in called ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And that's beginning to grasp this notion of stakeholder capitalism, serving everyone well. And I'm actually a supporter of ESG. Like anything, it can go too far, it can go in the wrong direction, but in concept, I believe it's moving in the right direction. Um, you know, getting back to Catholicism, you know, I was interviewed by Forbes a few years ago and Pope Francis came to the U.S. because Pope Francis has quite frankly been very critical of capitalism, but he's talking about shareholder capitalism. And in Pope Francis's view, capitalism is responsible for a lot of the world's woes. He believes that capitalism is what, you know, is increasing each year, the divide between the rich and the poor that capitalism is taking advantage of the world's resources and creating the climate issues we have, which he says has a disproportionate impact on poor countries and the poor um, and what have you. And, um, you know, and, you know, that God created this, this, this beautiful world. But, you know, I believe that, that capitalism uh, can be absolutely the answer and a very good answer if it, if it evolves, and I think it needs to evolve to succeed. So I think, you know, kind of in conclusion, that ESG, environmental, social, and governance, we'll call it board metrics, are a good thing, and stakeholder capitalism along with it 
um, but the momentum, the momentum will continue and it's a good thing. Number two is that a leader's greatest performance tool is culture. Uh, more than anything else. Obviously, it's more than that. You know, you have to have the right people, you have to have the right strategy, but culture is the most important at all. And culture is based upon people, customers, and purpose are the most successful. And if you really want to have an impact with culture, define it. A lot of companies say, we have a strong culture. I ask them, okay, explain it to me, and they can't. So that, that leads me to suspect uh, that it could be much better and much stronger if they defined it and measured it. Um, number three, I think we're going to see a new leader emerge. Uh, and it's, I'm really watching it in this pandemic period where people are not coming back to work. Uh, and also with the barriers to exit, even when people do come back to their jobs and do come back to work in a remote environment, the barriers to exit are low. So I know, you know, there's a big company in a city I know that the CEO was a real jerk. He treated all the, pe the people there horribly, but they couldn't leave because their kids were in school there, their spouses had a job there, they were really stuck. In the new world, they're not stuck. So the new leader to succeed is going to have to be that person that can attract and retain talent who can leave easily. And also, it's even more of a challenge to build a strong culture where people are only working part-time in the office or possibly remote all the time. You have to be creative and really focus on creating that reason and that bond for people to work. Um, next item, Pope Francis, you know, he kind of condemns shareholder capitalism, but, uh, but I, you know, I think capitalism can and will evolve. And my real goal is to have Pope Francis be our biggest cheerleader. And so that's kind of one of my, hope he hangs around. I actually like this Pope um, a lot, uh, uh, but, um, you know, I would like him to be a, uh, a you know a real a real cheerleader. You know, when I when I look talk to CEOs about stakeholder capitalism, what I have found is those that start to take it seriously and do things like um, pay studies, they're shocked at their frontline workers. You know, when they compare that to let's say the living wage in the city they live in, what that truly means in terms of how they can live or support their family. They've never really, really done the research and the math and figured out, boy, what is $12 an hour or $15 an hour or $18 an hour mean in terms of the quality of life of people I say I care about? Um, now, obviously it's a competitive world, but just knowing that is, uh, is important. The other thing I think that the, uh, the pandemic has taught us is our frontline essential workers, they saved our collective butt during this pandemic. They were the ones that came to work every day. They had to wear masks. Um, when we, you know, before vaccines, before we really knew, you know, how to deal with the pandemic, um, they're really, really important to the success of this country. So I'm, I'm hoping the pandemic has given us um, a, uh, an appreciation for the frontline workers, which, you know, kind of the, um, the, on the, you know, as you think about Catholicism, it's almost the way you think about those less fortunate or the poor, how CEOs think about frontline or entry or minimum skill uh, or, uh, uh, you know, or, or those kinds of workers. And kind of finally, I'll conclude it with, uh, you know, I am extremely, optimistic about what I see as the future of, of capitalism. I see it moving uh, in the right direction. And, um, you know, as a, as a Catholic, um, I think that business leadership uh, is perhaps the most impactful vocation that any Catholic could choose. So that's... Uh, that's the end of my comments, and I am very happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.